peculiar in the sense of odd may be more true than uh, you might think, especially if you ask my wife. I do pick on my wife too much from the pulpit. Some of the ladies get on to me about that. And so I'd like to tell you tonight that my wife is an angel. She's always up in the air without anything to wear, harping on something. <laughs> and I'll pay for that one too. <clears throat> it's so good to have so many come our way at this time of year and we're grateful that you're here. Many of you have made long trips to be with us for this lectureship. We pray that all those who are yet to arrive will have a safe journey, that our time spent together this week studying God's Word will be fruitful, and we know that it will. We've already heard some wonderful things by the three speakers that have spoken to us thus far. I appreciate so much, especially the older men in our brotherhood who now possess hoary heads and years of experience. I know that it breaks their heart to realize what is taking place in the Church of Our Lord in this century, in this decade. I know that it breaks our Lord's heart as well. And yet I'm thankful that there are many people of, of different ages that are fully conscious of the problem and are doing what they can to handle the situation. And you know, despite the fact that we, be, we gain a reputation for seemingly always being negative, I don't think that's a fair representation of the case, but even if that were, I do not think that we, in any sense, intend to convey the idea that we are not convinced that God is still in heaven, that he's still sitting on the throne, that the church of our Lord will endure forever, we may get down in terms of numbers rather slim, but that's happened so many times before in history, and it has not in any way dampened or prevented uh, those who remain faithful to the Lord to be what they need to be. We can make it to heaven. And consequently, despite current conditions, we seem to be at one of those points in history where the church of our Lord has deteriorated to a great extent. And yet, uh, we are confident that God's will still reigns supreme and that the Lord's, the, uh, the church's future is indeed bright. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Kings beginning in chapter 18 or the parallel material in 2 Chronicles 29. And let's study the 8th century B.C. when a 25-year-old man ascended the throne of the nation of Judah. This king's name was Hezekiah, a king whose reign is given an unqualified, favorable assessment by the inspired writer. Why? Because 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5, he trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. It was during his reign that the great prophets Micah and Isaiah performed their great work. As soon as this young king came to the throne, he set about doing what many in the church today are arguing cannot be done. Hezekiah, in fact, accomplished what many in our day insist cannot be accomplished. And that is the restoration of pure biblical religion. The reestablishment of the church of Christ in the 20th century as it existed in the 1st century. Now, he did not do that, mind you, by holding unity summits. Hezekiah did not accomplish his great work by participating in conventions with his religious neighbors. He didn't do it with just a lot of talk that's designed to promote goodwill and pleasant feelings among people, get people together, get to know each other and feel better about one another. Nor did he achieve his task by minimizing the situation, whitewashing it, misrepresenting it, pretending that it's not as serious as in fact it was, or by interpreting conditions in such a way as to leave people in a sort of a comfortable, pleasant state of tolerance. 
How then did he, in the midst of this tremendous spiritual decay and deterioration, how did he set about the task of restoring biblical religion? Well, in the very first month of the very first year of his reign, he instituted sweeping reforms which were calculated to bring the nation back into harmony with the will of God. He approached the task as if it could be accomplished. He spawned a tremendous restoration movement that was intended to full and completely re-establish biblical teachings, practices, and forms. How did he do that now? Number one, he began to purify the temple. He assembled the Levites and essentially said to them, Listen, fellas, you need to get busy, sanctify yourselves, and then clean out the filth in the temple. That job basically amounted to going into the temple, removing every unclean object, and taking all of that and throwing it into the Kidron Valley. And within two weeks and two days, the job was completed. The temple was cleansed. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 29:35. As a result of those noble efforts, the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And brethren, I'm convinced it can be done today. Objective number two, reinstatement of the sacrificial system and celebration of the Passover. No doubt there were Jews who continued to be involved in this sort of religious requirement in that day. But nevertheless, large numbers of Israelites had stopped traveling to Jerusalem and had completely neglected the observance of these items of worship. And so the king sent couriers throughout all of Judah and Israel urging people to come to Jerusalem and once again celebrate the Passover together as God intended them to do. Those couriers went out and you know they faced verbal abuse, ridicule, scorn. And yet in spite of that, there was a very large crowd of people who came to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread and what a celebration they had. The sacrificing, the rejoicing, the singing, the words of encouragement that were spoken by the king to those Levites who had demonstrated an accurate understanding of how to perform service to the Lord, all of that because people were seeing what it can be like to bring oneself back into harmony with Bible teaching. Brethren, why can't we do that today? Why is it that the indicators, the criteria by which we determine what kind of a church we want to be a part of are criteria that simply are not acceptable to God? If you want enthusiasm, if you want a warm environment, if you want a lot of bigness and a lot of hubbub, I can point you to a lot of churches where you'd be happy. Why, though, can we not be happy and vibrant and excited with simple obedience to the will of God, bringing our lives into harmony with what God would have us to do, there is the power for survival. And these people understood that. And so there was great joy in Jerusalem. Second Chronicles 30 verse 26 for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Indeed, for the first time in a long time, their prayers reached heaven and were heard by God. Brethren, it can be done. The third phase of Hezekiah's restoration movement involved penitent people who had come to Jerusalem, who then fanned out from Jerusalem on their way home to their respective tribal homelands. As they went, they smashed, cut down, destroyed, tore up, demolished every sign of apostasy they could get their hands on. That meant then that they purged the high places, the Asherah poles, the images, the sacred stones. You remember that brass snake in Numbers 21.9 that Moses had set up many years before as an antidote to snake bites because of their disobedience? Do you know that this snake was still in existence several hundred years later? That in fact it had come to symbolize the snake god of Baal worshippers, Nehushtan, and they were worshipping this thing. And so you see even that was destroyed. 
that which originally was intended to provide the people with an avenue of obedient faith to God had actually become an avenue of departure and rebellion against the God of heaven. Incredible. And the final aspect of Hezekiah's reformation entailed the proper dispensing of various contributions to the priests and to the Levites in order to sustain them while they went about the business of temple service. These contributions were needed for special sacrificial offerings that were associated with the temple. And so all of these marvelous measures serve to restore God's written instructions. And so we are told, thus did Hezekiah throughout all of Judah and wrought that which was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God and in every work that he began in the service of the house of God and in the law and in the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all of his heart and prospered. Brethren, it can be done. Our day is no different. We face the same sort of departure from the will of God. And the restoration process must occur. Whenever the church of our Lord experiences widespread decline and deterioration, whenever we suddenly wake up and realize that the body of our beloved Savior in many places has undergone gradual change, whenever we recognize that the church in many sectors of the brotherhood has been restructured and reoriented, when we look around us and see churches of Christ in many locales which have been defaced and transformed into a different entity, don't we suddenly realize that indeed history repeats itself? We're facing the same conditions that God's people have faced many times in the past. And so whenever Josiah and Ezra and Nehemiah and, and Hezekiah found themselves in the midst of a landslide of apostasy, they took steps that God wanted them to take. Hezekiah valiantly reached for the firm, solid, unshifting security of God's guidelines. He grasped them, and he anchored himself to them. And then he set about the business of trying to get others to do the same. You see, Hezekiah understood that the Mosaic system could be restored. Anytime God gives to mankind a series or set of instructions or guidelines or precepts or principles by which he must live, then man can live by them. And Hezekiah understood that. And so he set about the task of reinstituting and completely restoring to their former status the teachings of God for that day. Brethren, I'm convinced that restoration in our day is much more easily accomplished than their day. Judaistic religion was dependent upon several aspects that we are not responsible for. They had a specific location. It had to be Jerusalem. If you're uprooted out of your homeland and sent off into captivity, you cannot worship God the way it was originally intended to be. They had specific objects that were associated with proper approach to God. It had to be a specific racial group and all sorts of things. And yet there are those in our day who are telling us we cannot restore the church. It's a process. You never accomplish it. In which case we're just one denomination among many. And what the denominations have told us all along, that is that we're all headed to the same place just by different routes, makes perfectly good sense. Hezekiah didn't see it that way. There was a statement that was made by a well-known brother in 1985 at the Freed Hardman Preacher and Church Leaders Forum in October of 85. Now, brethren, I realize that we live at a period of time, particularly in our culture, it seems, that we tense up a bit whenever we start getting too specific about people. We don't like to name names. We don't like to pinpoint specific religious groups. I'm in sympathy with a concern for gentleness, for consideration, for courtesy. But I'll tell you, I'm convinced we're living in a day where we'd better start getting back to brass tacks and speaking plainly. We're letting too much pass by 
in the name of courtesy that's going to cause people to lose their souls and we may well lose our souls in the process for so doing. Now this dear brother who has done so many good things in the past made a statement in 1985 to this effect. We have restored the, or I fear therefore that some of us have ceased to view restoration as a process in which each person struggles to discover through the Bible truths he has not known. Instead we think of restoration as a state that has been fully achieved. Now, I want you to compare that statement with an article that I ran across in the Gospel Advocate written by the same individual in 1978. I'd be happy for you to look at that. We have restored the New Testament church and have exactly the same situation which the church had in the first century. Now those two statements are diametrically in contradiction to one another. And yet this brother declares that he has not changed his doctrinal stance in one iota. Brethren, there's evidence that individuals within our fellowship who in the past have been no doubt good men, great men who have taught and accomplished much in the service of the Lord, and yet they are now involved in leading, participating in, if not leading, in the apostasy. We are at a time where we must open our eyes and stop being naive and vulnerable and foolish. We must be kind and loving, but we had better face reality. Could Jews in Hezekiah's day, like some members of the Church of Christ in our day, have accused those who were trying to be faithful of being haughty or arrogant for thinking, for having the gall to think they could actually restore biblical religion? Could they have argued that, that you simply perceive this as a process, as an attempt to restore, but it can't be done? You suppose Hezekiah and those who agreed with him and participated with him could have very easily been accused of, of circling the wagons? of crystallizing his religion? You think he could have been accused of patternist orthodoxy or blueprint religion? I don't know if you're familiar with any of these terms that I've used, but they are very widely thrown around among some of our brethren in an attempt to ridicule and to oppose those within the brotherhood who are, tr who are trying to remain faithful to the old paths. Brethren, we've got major currents running through the church of the 1980s that are creating big problems and are resulting in the loss of many precious souls. We've got individuals within the church, grievous wolves within the flock, Acts 20, 29, who by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple, Romans 16, verse 18, whose mouths must be stopped, Titus 1, verse 11. In fact, if I didn't know better, I would think that the church of our day is the victim of a conspiracy that's being orchestrated on a wide scale to actually eradicate the true church from our midst. These efforts manifest themselves in the form of various destructive philosophies and theologies that have made significant inroads into our colleges, into our larger churches, it seems, in particular. No different than the digression of the late 1800s. No different from digressions that have existed throughout history. I won't take the time to list many of these. I've mentioned three in the manuscript, and some of these have been mentioned by previous speakers. Let me just comment very briefly. One of those is the attempt to to eradicate the distinction between the New Testament church, the church of our Lord, and denominations. There is a widespread attempt to do that very thing. To just sort of blur the distinction, bring about ambiguity, obscurity, and all of us just put our arms around one another and forget the differences. This is manifesting itself through the so-called unity movement, attempts to fellowship the denominations, 
to treat them as if we're all in the same boat and it's taking its toll on the church of our Lord. You know, brethren, this whole restoration clouding can be settled very easily. Listen closely. Two, two premises. One, can we know the plan of salvation? Can we know what to do to become a Christian? Well, if we can, then the church of Christ can exist in this century, in this place. If people will just obey that plan. It's that simple. Don't tell me there's some long, drawn-out restoration process. Just teach people the plan of salvation, which is rooted in and centered in the gospel of Christ, and you've got the church of Christ in existence right now. Premise number two. Can we understand, can we fathom what the Bible teaches about how to live a faithful Christian life? And can we do that? Well, if so, then we can identify the church. We can actually take our finger and point at people and say, there is the church of Christ. It exists now, and it's very different from the denominations. Now, isn't that simple? And yet, by the treatises that I've read, among some of our apparently more scholarly brethren, and listening to some of the things that they teach and preach, boy, this task is far beyond our ability to even approach. And if you ever ask yourself why anyone would want to even push that point and make that point and try to convince people that it's that difficult to accomplish, you answer that question and you will have gone a long way toward sizing up the gravity of the evil that's connected with the problems that we have in the church today. A second problem that's facing us is teachings on the Holy Spirit. And I realize we've had a lot of good teaching on the Holy Spirit among those who are faithful to the Lord's cause, but perhaps the time has come for us to restudy this thing with a view toward responding to some of the stuff that's being taught in the church today on this thing. I'm convinced we've got full-fledged Pentecostalism in churches of Christ. It's rooted in this Holy Spirit doctrine, and it's popping up in books, the worldly church and other books, uh, just raw, full-fledged, charismatic sort of things. And you can mark it down. It's going to take its toll on the thinking of many within the church. And thirdly, there is a major attack underway concerning hermeneutics, uh, concerning how to understand the Bible, how to interpret the Bible. I'll tell you, if the task is as difficult as it's being made in some of our graduate schools of religion and other similar contexts, the task is hopeless. You just as well give up. It's so discouraging to hear men who have drank long from the pools of denominational theology, who are obsessed with Bart and Bultmann and Kierkegaard and Schleiermacher, and who then spew that stuff through the minds of young men who are studying in our schools and giving them the impression that this has something to do with New Testament Christianity. I'm sick of it. And it's tearing the church apart. And my generation and those who come after are the victims of that nonsense. And we are seeing widespread effects already. And I footnoted some of these sources that I, I have no hesitation in calling your attention to. Patternist hermeneutics were being accused of. Well, I don't mind the term any more than I mind the term legalist. Because it was John and Jesus who said, if you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. Now, if that's legalistic, I'll accept the term. And if telling people that they must conform themselves to the teachings of the Bible, call that pattern or otherwise, I'm guilty of patternist hermeneutics, but only because I'm convinced that's what the Bible teaches. We're book, chapter, and verse men, and that is a, a term that's used as a term of ridicule 
to cast reflection upon faithful preachers of the gospel who for years have taught Bible. They may not have gone very far in secular education, but at least they had enough sense to absorb the Bible and consequently to be more educated than any of their, their peers who bothered to cast dispersions in their direction, of whom the world was not worthy. These three demonstrations of intellectual snobbery represent a serious threat to the stability of God's people in our day. We are in need of the same ingredients that fostered the restoration in Hezekiah's day. Will you please consider these six drawn from these texts in Kings and Chronicles. The first, we need a renewed awareness of God's anger. Now you can talk all night about how, well, we used to preach hellfire and brimstone, but we finally restudied and discovered God's grace. Well, the time has come for us to restudy and discover God's anger. Hezekiah pleaded with his contemporaries. Why? 2 Chronicles 30, verse 8. Serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Brethren, the God that many in the church today worship is a very different God than the God Hezekiah worshiped. But I submit to you, he has not changed. And so our concept of God must be brought into alignment with Hezekiah's concept because God said he was right. We need to renew an awareness of God's anger. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Is that Old Testament? No, that's Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31. God is a consuming fire. Is that Old Testament? No, that's Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. And yet those passages have no real meaning for many people in the church today. You remember Ezra's attitude in Ezra 9.4 when they came out of captivity and began to realize how far they had apostatized and what it was going to take to get people back in light, in harmony with God's will, even to the point of breaking up marriages. Do you remember what his attitude was? Ezra chapter 9 verse 4 and Ezra chapter 10 verse 3. He trembled at the word of the Lord. We need to think long and hard about the implications of Jesus' words in Luke 12. Be not afraid of them that kill the body, and after that have no more they can do to you. I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Brethren, those were Jesus' words. Number two, we're prone to negligence. Listen to Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles 29, 11. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him. He was saying, fellas, you've got a responsibility. You've got to live up to it. You've got to perform it. God is watching. He's waiting. Follow through. And it's no different today. We've got rampant negligence in the church of our day. Church discipline evangelistic activity, failure to oppose false teachers, failure to be what, what Jesus said the church at Laodicea should have been, hot, Revelation 3.16, failure to defend the truth of the gospel. These circumstances reflect the same sort of negligence that was evident in Hezekiah's day. Number three, we need a massive dose of humility. You're aware of the fact that the Bible says in many places that really when you get down to the root of man's problem of sin there's pride there's arrogance that was Satan's problem and it's been man's problem ever since have you stopped to contemplate even for a moment how much of the digression and apostasy in our day can be sorted out and analyzed in light of that teaching have you ever thought about so many of the things that we are frantically grasping after Big numbers, big buildings, big money. Have you ever stopped and thought about that actually behind all of the thrill and excitement is an appeal to man's pride? That's really what's going on there? That we need to humble ourselves before the God of heaven and that that will go a long way towards solving the problems that have arisen in our day. 
We need a massive dose of humility. If we cannot humble ourselves, listen to God, and be willing to conform to his words, James chapter 4, verse 6, we have no hope. We have no hope. A fourth aspect of Hezekiah's restoration, a sense of shame felt by those who had strayed away from God's will. 2 Chronicles 30, verse 15. People in our day are not ashamed anymore. We're like Jeremiah's day. We can't even blush over our sins. In fact, we are told in our day that feelings of guilt and shame are counterproductive to self-esteem and healthy psychological outlook. How foreign to divine reality. That may be Freud, but that's not Jesus Christ. That's not God. Whenever people violate God's will, God wants them to feel ashamed. He wants them to be filled with a sense of their own monstrous condition, Acts 9, 6. He wants their consciences to be pricked, Acts chapter 2, verse 37. He wants them to feel godly sorrow that they might repent and conduct themselves differently. Indeed, whenever I was watching the Donahue program several years ago, as no doubt you did, and listened to this woman argue her case against the Church of Christ in Collinsville, Oklahoma, and the reason why it was proper for her to go to court and sue the body of Christ, because they had publicly shamed her, and how dare they do that? I suppose she's never read 2 Thessalonians 3.14, where public discipline, Withdrawal of fellowship is calculated to do that very thing, that he may be ashamed. We need more people like Ezra. Ezra was so appalled and so humiliated at the departure from the word of the Lord which had occurred that he fell down on his knees, he spread open his hands toward heaven, and he prayed, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush." To lift my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head and our trespass is grown up unto heaven. Is that attitude in existence in the church today? Fifthly, for true religion to be restored, we must tr be true to God's directions, faithful to the book. Listen to 2 Chronicles 31.20. Hezekiah wrought that which was good and right and truth before the Lord is God. Isn't that simple? Simple statement, and yet how neglected. Truth here is talking about being faithful and loyal to God. When it's all said and done, when we've gone through all the rationalizing as to why we do what we do in religion, we're still faced with whether what we do is in fact what God wants us to do. Churches among us are introducing into their practice all sorts of activities and programs. And upon what basis are these innovations justified? Read the church bulletins, they'll tell you. Well, it meets our needs. Or, well, it gets more people involved. Or it brings in lots of people. Or it generates enthusiasm. Or it creates a warm, accepting environment. Or it keeps our young people more active. And on and on and on. I suppose good. Good effects. But lay those things right down next to the Bible. And you see how far we have strayed from our biblical moorings. Whatever happened to Bible authority? Whatever happened, forgiving is the reason for why we do things because this is what God told us we're supposed to do. You know, that sounds so simple, but it sounds so odd. So odd. I suppose we passed through a period where we took that for granted, but brethren, we took it for granted so much that now we don't even take it. That's not even a consideration. That's why our hermeneutics is being restudied and rethought. People are now saying, what are you arguing about instrumental music for? You don't even have to have Bible authority for those things. That's not an issue anymore. God doesn't care what you introduce into worship. And you see they're in a totally different ballpark. 
And so many of our number are stampeding to the same arena. Whatever happened to speaking as the oracles of God? Whatever happened, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, to not going above that which is written? It's still in the book. And so truth and faithfulness by definition involves conformance to divine directives. Right doing, not going onward and beyond the doctrine of Christ. It means being faithful to the law and to the commandments. And the final ingredient identified in the life of Hezekiah, which fostered restoration, was the intensity and character of his obedience. Look at 2 Chronicles 31, verse 21. He did it with all of his heart. He did it with all of his heart. So many people in the Bible are identified as being individuals who in fact followed God or worshipped God or approached God, but so many times the Bible says, but he didn't do it completely. He didn't do it with a whole heart, with a perfect heart. It's like, it's like Lot's wife. She, she left the city and was headed in the right direction, but she wasn't convinced that's where she wanted to go. And that's a big problem. And it will certainly kill any effort to restore the New Testament church. You cannot have a pure, complete church of Christ with that sort of attitude dominating the scene. Are we wishy-washy? Are we weak and easily swayed to the wrong like Aaron and Saul and so many others in history? Do we allow our strong family ties and the deep emotions that we feel for them to deter us from bowing submissively to God and giving Him exclusive allegiance? What motivates us? What guides us? What is it that, per that we permit to sway us and direct us in life? God said we'd better be ready to forfeit even our loved ones and to be dauntless and unintimidated in the face of opposition like Micaiah. May God grant us more elders, more members of the church who will rise up and insist upon reform and a return to God's way. We need more members of the church who are less enamored by the latest thrills, gimmicks, and excitement that rises within the church that's nothing more than a baptized form, I suppose, of denominationalism. We need people who get far more excited, far more thrilled, far more enthusiastic about the simple but powerful and potent words of God and the sensation that one derives from knowing that one has simply done what God told him to do. Whatever happened to the excitement that was generated by that? How we could ever get to the point to where other things cause us excitement sooner than those things. Brethren, may we in the face of these threats, these verbal assaults, and all of these things that allure and sidetrack us, May we, in fact, proceed confidently to comply with God's wishes. You remember Abraham in Romans chapter 4, who did not waver through unbelief, but rather was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. Let us insist that people in and out of the church bring their lives into absolute conformity with the will of God. Let us oppose efforts within the church that dilute and pervert pure doctrine and practice. Let us do all these things with meekness and fear, with gentleness, with grace, with brotherly love, with compassion, humility, with long-suffering, with patience. But let us firmly do it. Satan cannot help but be pleased with every effort afoot today that manages to blur and minimize the distinction between the church of our Lord and the denominational world. Brethren, may we strive with all of our being to stand fast in the faith, to not be swept along with the great swelling tide of apostasy, but to be a part of this great movement of God, to faithfully follow Him into eternity prepared. Are you prepared tonight? Are you a member of the Lord's body? 
You know, that plan is so simple and yet so profound and so critical. You know, if a person loves the Lord, I mean, if that person has come to an understanding of the will of God and believes in God's word, then that faith will cause that individual to change his mind about his past. That's repentance. And that penitence will, lead, will cause him then to live a different life. That means that he will confess the name of Christ before men and then be baptized in water for the remission of sins to enter into the church to begin that great trek toward heaven. Have you done that tonight? Why would you delay another moment? What in this life offers you anything that can even begin to compare with what God offers with the commencement of initiation into his kingdom with that simple, simple plan? We members of the church have a great responsibility upon our shoulders. I'm thankful to God that his word is having free course in the hearts of many people outside of this nation, South Africa, for instance. The word of God is spreading. People are hungry for the word of God. True, simple truths that so many in our day in this country seem to be bored with and looking so eagerly for some new thing. Christian, ask God to forgive you for that attitude. And step forward tonight resolved to be invigorated by the words of God and to permit those words to be your beacon in this life as you walk in the lowly paths of Jesus. Tonight, if you need to come, we pray you will as we stand and sing.